that is it working? Okay. All right, well, you know, today I just want to share some experience that we've had using the, the uh, MP1 system, microperimetry systems, uh, integrating into our daily practice and evaluation of our patients. Now, without a doubt, the, the OCT has provided significant advances in our, our evaluation of the patients on a daily basis. But quite often when we have a system we don't really know, and we see, and we see an image. We don't really know what that re that refers to in terms of daily function for the patient. And I think, you know, using the the OCT, using these type of systems, it will give you a better idea uh, in in terms of understanding what it is that the patients are complaining about. And let me, and we'll show you some examples. As you know. Uh, Microperimetry gives you a couple of advantages, and that is that it, it lets you test macular sensitivity, and more specifically, it lets you go into specific areas so that you have an idea of both a topographic view of what's happening and then a functional test of those areas. So quite often, you know, you can, you can use these systems to, to try and go back to your, your different studies and, and correlate whether or not what you're seeing there makes sense with, with what, the, what the system is, is, is picking up. Okay? The, the, the advantage of this system is that uh, the resulting visual field is registered. So if you, if, you keep, if you use it properly, you can test the same site. You can be well assured that you're testing the same site multiple times and follow up on these patients. So not only can you see progression of a problem, at the same time, you can measure the effectiveness of whatever treatments that you're using. For example, on diabetic macular edema or cystoid macular edema, you can quite often see, you know, some of these these uh, changes and the benefits. Obviously, from a from a research standpoint, that also helps us trying to understand what it is that we're seeing on on on, on these images. And the importance is this here. You know, again, they're reproducible, so you can you know you can safely consider. The, the, those points and compare over time what's happening uh, I, I, to your patients. Now, I think the best way for me to give you a, a, a sense of what you can do with this is to show you examples. Uh, this is a, th these patients tend to be very difficult. You know, this is, a, a, this is an older individual with, with retinitis pigmentosa. As you can see, the visual acuity is not bad for a person of that age with, uh, with RP. But when the patient comes in, quite often, you know, they can't come and tell you, doctor, you know, I have a, a, I have a 15 degree field, you know, in, in one eye and a 5 degree in the other, and, you know, they're very nonspecific. The complaints are nonspecific. So for you to understand and for you to make good recommendations to them as to what they need to do, you know, you really need to have a good idea of what the functional status of the retina is. And traditionally, you know, we have, we use a fundus exam, we use, you know, if you start getting more sophisticated, you start using autofluorescence and you're trying to determine, you know, where the area of the pathology is. And, and in this case, you know, for those of you who are familiar with autofluorescence, you know, some of the dogma is that, you know, any, if you see these rings of hyperfluorescence, typically what that, that means is that you have an area where there's different levels of functional RP coming from from this, from this point on center. And typically, the dogma is that out from here, the function tends to be poor, okay? So if that's true, then, you know, this patient, uh, you know, as you will see, will have a very significant reduction in, 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 their, in their, their functional retinal uh, tissue. Now, when you look at the, uh, at the OCT of this particular patient, aside from, you know, from the, the, the loss of the photoreceptors from this point on, uh, you know, you can see that the autofluorescence does in fact correlate well where, with where you have some of that loss of the, the uh, where the ring is at and then the edge of the photoreceptors. You know, the other important information that the OCT gives you is obviously there's an area of focal macular traction there. Is that significant or not in, 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 in this patient? And then, you know, if you're trying to evaluate these people and, and trying to determine if that's going to be something important, i.e., a, a surgical issue, uh, you need to have a way to really test to see what impact that's having on your patient's vision. So this is the this is the right eye, obviously, uh, and this is the the left eye. You, you if you look here, you can see that at least anatomically, the the area where the photoreceptors are it, it still exist is tends to be very similar to 
to the one uh, in, the, in, in the right eye, if you, look at, if you look at the two. The only difference between this eye and the other is this area of, of traction. So now, looking at this, you wouldn't be able to determine which eye is, has a better function from a, a macular sensitivity standpoint, uh, the right eye versus the left eye. Looking at the anatomy, you'd say, well, you know, perhaps there's going to be more of a problem here because you have some foveal macular traction there. You know, the other eye tends to have a more normal anatomic appearance of the, of the fovea. Is that, in fact, true or not? Well, when you, when you go forward and you test this patient, you know, it's, it's the opposite. Okay, interesting enough, you can see that this patient, you know, again, we, we, used, to, we used to determine, you know, that it, we used to think that the functional retina is going to be right in this area. Before we had autofluorescence and we've, before we had uh, the way to evaluate the photoreceptors, you'd look at, you, your exam would sort of tell you what's happening, and then obviously your visual fields. The visual fields for me tended to be not very helpful because it, it wouldn't give me a real detailed area of exactly where the patient is, is, was using to, to see and, and where the usual, their useful vision was at. And here, you know, I can understand why this patient at this age, even with 2050 vision, has very significant complaints during daylight as well. And the reason is that, you know, she's basically functioning out of the right eye for the most part. And, and it's basically the central area here. So again, you know, remember, remember the appearance. I mean, you would expect, perhaps, that this eye would have the worst change. You know, sometimes, you know, we, we follow these type of, of, of changes and, and, and wrongfully we would elect to do surgery. In this case, it's not a good example, but again, you know, Understanding what actually is happening, you know, can help you decide, in fact, that that's not what you want to do to this particular patient, okay? Here's another example. Here's a younger one, okay? This is a very interesting patient because, you know, when you, before we had these high-resolution OCTs, you know, the only way you'd diagnose the, the, the CME is if you did an exam or your fluorescein, okay? So now that we have these things, what do you do with these patients? This is a young guy, he's 20, 30, 20, 25 in one eye, 20, 30 in the other eye, okay? And what, what had happened is that this individual had complained about decreased vision in the other eye, and, and, and if you look at his OCT, the, the left eye had a very similar appearance. There was a huge cystic areas here, centrally. There was a, an epiretinal membrane. And in the other eye, he actually didn't have a little bit more traction, and he started decreasing vision. So the question is, what do you do to a patient like this? You know, when they have that, you know, when they have good vision, now you have these high-resolution OCTs. You see these areas of cystic change here. You know, do you treat that, or do you monitor that? You know, if you look in the literature, you're going to find that there isn't any real clear-cut direction of where you need to go with these patients. Um, I mean, if I showed you this this OCT, and I didn't tell you what the patient's visual acuity was, you, you know, wrongfully, you would, you would guess that the vision was poor, okay? Again, 2025, with this appearance. So again, you know, the problem with the OCT is it's, it's, it gives you beautiful images, but it doesn't really give you a good idea of what the actual functional status of the tissue is. And I think, again, this is where this, this instrument is helpful. This individual did, in fact, have a vitrectomy with a membrane peel in the other eye. And, and actually, you know, I don't have the pre-surgery uh, pre OCTs, but he had a very similar situation. And his, his uh, edema got better, but when you look at his, his function, look at the difference. You know, the eye with the big intraretinal cystic changes has better central macular function than the eye that had the vitrectomy. So what we're doing for this individual is, you know, I tell him, you know, I, yes, in fact, I see the big cystic changes there, but sh what I'm gonna like to do is I'm gonna opt to monitor you, okay? And you, you can be, you can treat him plus or minus with uh, uh, Diamox, you know, whatever you wanna do. I have some other patients where we're doing that, you know, because he elected to, to wanna do that. But in a situation like this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this device as a way to follow him 
and determine whether or not I need to do anything else from an inter in interventional standpoint because using the OCT by itself is really not helping me. And, and, 